All matter that has mass and volume is made of small particles. The movement of the particles creates a form of energy, heat. Heat is defined as the total kinetic energy contained by the particles. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. The water temperature of the two containers are exactly the same, whereas the container on the left has more water and therefore contains more heat than the container on the right. The relationship between heat and temperature is similar to that between weight and density. A ping pong ball is lighter than a steel ball of the same size, but a truckload of ping pong balls combined are heavier than a shoebox of steel balls. The particles in solids are bonded firmly together. Heating a solid to a certain temperature breaks its particles apart to form a liquid. Heating a liquid to a certain temperature breaks the particles apart even further to form a gas. When an ice cube is heated and reaches zero degrees C, the ice cube starts to melt. Adding more heat will raise the water temperature. When it reaches 100 degrees C, it starts to boil and evaporate into water vapor. This ice water vapor shift is a heat absorbing process. The opposite is a heat release process. Sensible heat is the energy required to change the temperature. It is the dry heat that relates directly to the air temperature. This is a heat that one can sense and measure by a regular thermometer. Latent heat is the energy absorbed by or released from a substance during a phase change. It is the wet heat contained in the body of air that cannot be measured by a regular thermometer. Dry air is mainly composed of nitrogen and oxygen. The amount of water vapor in air varies significantly. Absolute humidity measures the amount of water vapor in a body of air regardless of its temperature. It is expressed at the mass of water vapor divided by the mass of dry air or divided by the volume of dry air. Relative humidity is the ratio of the amount of water vapor that is currently present in the air to the maximum amount that the air can hold under specific temperature and pressure conditions. The level of relative humidity in the body of air is determined by two factors, assuming pressure is constant, the amount of water vapor in air and the air temperature. For example, at 10 degrees C, a body of air can hold a maximum of 100 grams of water vapor. If the air currently contains 25 grams of water, its relative humidity is at 25%. Adding 25 grams of water will increase the relative humidity to 50%. Adding 50 grams more will reach the maximum capacity the air can hold, making relative humidity 100%. If more water is added, the air will condensate. In this case, the amount of water vapor stays constant in this body of air. Dropping the air temperature will increase its relative humidity because the air's ability to hold water decreases. In this example, the relative humidity reaches 100% when the temperature drops to 10 degrees C. 
Lowering the temperature further will make the air condensate. Dry bulb temperature refers to the ambient air temperature measured by a regular thermometer. It is called dry bulb because the bulb of the thermometer is not affected by the moisture of the air. Dry bulb temperature measures the effect of moisture by using a thermometer with its bulb covered by a wet cloth. Unless the air vapor mixture is at 100% relative humidity, the evaporation will cool the thermometer bulb, so the measured temperature will be lower than the dry bulb temperature. If air is more humid, evaporation will be slower and the difference between dry bulb and wet bulb will be smaller. In a completely saturated body of air, the wet bulb temperature is equal to the dry bulb temperature because evaporation stops. At this point, this air vapor mixture has reached its dew point. This temperature, 30 degrees C in this case, is called the dew point temperature. Solar energy is delivered from the sun to the earth in the form of solar radiation. In this process, some of the energy is reflected, some is absorbed by atmosphere and clouds, and the rest, approximately 50%, is absorbed by land and ocean. The objects and particles that solar radiation lands on are heated by the energy input from the sun. The heat generated is then emitted back to the atmosphere and space in the form of thermal radiation. Solar radiation is in the form of shorter wavelength, whereas thermal radiation is in longer ones. Both solar radiation and thermal radiation deliver radiant heat. However, radiant energy does not heat air directly. Instead, it delivers heat directly from a hot surface to a cold one. Radiant heat can play a significant role in achieving thermal comfort. For example, the ambient air temperature in both cases is 80 degrees F. On a sunny day, solar radiation delivers radiant heat to the person and makes her or him feel hot. On a cloudy day, less radiation falls on the person who feels okay, even though the air temperature is the same. In a room with an air temperature of 60 degrees F, occupants will likely feel cold. After the fire is started, the person immediately feels warm, even though the air temperature around the person is still at 60 degrees F. This is because radiant heat is radiated to the person from the fireplace. Therefore, the presence of high radiant heat can compensate for low ambient air temperatures. In this example, the indoor air temperature 72 degree F is within the comfort range. However, the occupant may lose a significant amount of body heat to the cold window surface through radiation. This person is likely to feel cold even though the air temperature is at a comfort level. To quantify the influence of surface temperatures on occupant comfort in the form of radiation, mean radiant temperature is used to measure the average temperature of the surfaces surrounding a point of interest. Assuming the room has the above surface areas and temperatures, the mean radiant temperature, Tr, at the center of the room is calculated by this formula. It is essentially the weighted surface temperature based on the area of the surfaces around the point.
A psychometric chart is a graphical representation of the physical and thermal properties of air. Dry bulb temperature is located on the x-axis of the psychometric chart represented by vertical lines. Absolute humidity is on the vertical y-axis with the lines of moisture content ratio running horizontally across the chart. Relative humidity is represented by the curved lines running from the bottom left to the top right. Y bulb temperatures are indicated by the diagonal lines running from lower right to upper left corners. Dew point temperature is determined by moving horizontally to the 100% relative humidity line. The line at the upper left boundary of the chart represents 100% relative humidity or saturation. A psychometric chart can be used in many different ways. It can be used to find air properties. For example, the dry bulb temperature and relative humidity of a location at a given time are 30 degrees C and 40%. Point A on the chart represents this air condition. From this point, all other air properties can be found. This example shows a heating process from point A at 25 degrees C dry bulb to point B at 35 degrees C dry bulb. In this process, the absolute humidity stays constant. However, the relative humidity drops from 60% to 35%. This example shows a cooling process from point A at 35 degrees C to point B at 25 degrees C dry bulb. In this process, the relative humidity increases from 35% to 60%. Continue to cool the air from point B until it reaches point C at 17 degrees C dry bulb. At point C, the relative humidity has increased to 100%, meaning the air is completely saturated and condensation is about to start. Therefore, C is the dew point and 17 degrees C is the dew point temperature. If cooling occurs beyond the dew point, the moisture in air will condensate and the absolute humidity will drop. The human body generates excess heat and needs to maintain a heat dissipation rate to operate properly. The body loses about 65% of its heat through radiation, 10 to 15% through convection, and about 2% through conduction. Heat loss rates through all these mechanisms are dependent upon ambient air temperature or surface temperature. When the temperatures are close to or higher than the body temperature, these methods become less efficient. In that case, humans will have to rely on evaporation and respiration, which is sweating and breathing, by which water from the body evaporates and takes the heat away. Actually, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers provides a range of climatic conditions in which a majority of people will feel comfortable. These conditions, the comfort zone, are between 20 degrees C and 26 degrees C and between 20% and 80% relative humidity. Two types of weather data are used in building design. The first one, design conditions for the worst case building loads calculations and equipment sizing. The second one is annual weather data for long-term energy consumption analysis.
Now let's focus on design conditions first. The design conditions consist of a typical hot summer day and a typical cold winter day. These represent the worst case or peak heating and cooling loads that the building systems are designed to handle. For example, in Phoenix, Arizona, the peak summer design temperature is 108.1 degree F, and the peak winter design temperature is 41.3 degree F. Now, let's look at any weather data, such as degree days, including heating degree days and cooling degree days, and typical meteorological data. Now, let's focus on degree days. Degree days are based on the assumption that when the outside temperature is 65 degree F, no heating or cooling is needed for the building to be comfortable. For heating degree days, if the temperature mean, which is the high temperature plus low temperature divided by two, on a day is below 65 degree F, the mean is subtracted from 65 and the result is the heating degree day for that day. For example, the high temperature for a particular day is 33 degree F, and the low temperature is 25 degree F. The temperature mean for that day is 33 degree plus 25 degree divided by two, which is 29 degree. Because the result is below 65, this counts as a heating degree day which is 65 minus 29 equals to 36. So 36 is the heating degree day for this particular day. For cooling degree days, if the temperature mean on a day is above 65 degree F, 65 is subtracted from the mean, and the result is the cooling degree day for that day. For example, the high temperature for a particular day is 90 degree F, and the low temperature is 66 degree F. The temperature mean for that day is 90 plus 66 divided by two, which is 78 degree F. Because the result is above 65, this counts as a cooling degree day. So it's 78 minus 65, which is 13. So 13 is a cooling degree day for this particular day. The daily degree days are then accumulated throughout the year for heating degree day and cooling degree day separately, and the sums are annual heating degree days and cooling degree days. This map shows the average annual heating degree days of the U.S. by census region. For example, the average heating degree days for New York is 5,780. Whereas in Texas, the number is only 2,248. This shows New York is in a colder climate. This map shows the average annual cooling degree days of the U.S. The average cooling degree days for New York is only 656, whereas in Texas, the number is 2,449. This shows Texas is in a much hotter climate. The United States can be broadly divided into eight climate regions based on two parameters, temperature and humidity. The continental U.S. consists of seven, and the eighth is found in Alaska. The International Code Council offers a more detailed approach to defining climate. Each zone is designated with a number Zone 1 being the hottest zone at the southern tip of Florida, Zone 8 being the coldest part in Alaska. Solar radiation is the total radiant energy emitted by the sun. There are two measures to quantify solar radiation. The power of solar radiation is measured by solar irradiance. The amount of electromagnetic radiation you bought received from the sun per unit area. The unit is watt per meter square. When solar radiation is accumulated over time, it is called solar insulation. 
which is a cumulative energy measured over a period of time per unit area. The unit is watt hour per meter square. This map shows the annual average solar insulation in the U.S. in kilowatt hours per meter square for an average day. The insulation level has many design implications. For example, one can determine the size of the solar collecting systems and how much energy they can produce.